I would like to bring before you today a word from Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59 at the beginning. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We are troubled because we see so little of God's saving power. Conversions are rare. The church in our land is declining. Secularism is increasing and the influence of Christianity is waning. The churches are divided and generally destroyed by liberalism and compromise with the world. We pray for revival and there is no answer. Why? Isaiah has a great message for us here. He says, the Lord's hand is not shortened. The God who stretched out his hand over the Red Sea and opened a passage for his people through it on dry land is still the same. The Lord who showed his power in giving Sarah a child when she was 90 years old has not changed. The almighty God who gave to Gideon victory with 300 men over a massive army of Midianites is still the same. Young David slew the mighty giant Goliath because God helped him. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were converted by the arm of the Lord. At the Reformation, God raised up a mighty church out of a dead organization. In the 18th century, God's hand upon Whitfield and Wesley transformed a nation, saving thousands. In the 19th century, a little prayer meeting at Fulton Street, New York, with God's blessing, started a movement that raised the dead across America and Europe. In the days of our fathers in the island of Lewis, revival followed revival and brought the fear of God upon these communities in which some of us were born and bred. But where is the hand of God today? Is it shortened? Has God grown old and weak? That ear of God which heard the prayers of our fathers, has it become deaf? Our cries for revival go unanswered. What is the problem? Is it a problem with God? Certainly not. Notice where the problem lies. It is not with God but with us. Verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. A wall has arisen between God and us. A barrier which separates God from us. What is the answer? We must repent. We must face up to our sins. Confess them and repent of them. What are these particular sins? As a nation, Isaiah 59 verse 3, your hands are defiled with blood. The blood of the unborn children, aborted, massacred in their millions by our wicked society, cries out to God for vengeance. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Lying has become second nature to our whole society. Perverse and blasphemous things are being uttered by our media constantly. We could go on and we could describe the immorality of our society which stinks in the nose of God. There is no doubt that judgment from the Lord rests upon us because of the sins of our nation. 
But God is particularly concerned with his church, with his people's sins. What are they? Well, first of all, there's the sin of worldliness. We live in luxury. We are satiated with trivial entertainment. We eat and drink and make merry and care little for God, though we profess his name. Secondly, pride. We are proud of our stand, our position, our achievements. We are constantly looking for the praise of man, for a claim from others. There is little consciousness of what spiritual pygmies we are. Thirdly, lust. We live in a society wallowing in sexual lust. And sadly, it has defiled even the Christians. The flesh is powerful, and it is hard to resist constantly these temptations. But God hates immorality. Fourthly, covetousness. Many of us grew up in relative poverty, but our world has changed dramatically, and there is so much more available today. It's easy to desire wealth and material prosperity. When God has blessed us with so much, it's wrong to be grumbling and complaining and discontent. Fifthly, division. Never were there more churches in our land, each trying to justify itself by criticizing others. The matters which divide several churches can hardly be described as fundamental. Some of our churches are very like one another and it would seem divided more by history than by principle. Christ prayed that we all might be one. Division is a sin. Sixthly, self-righteousness. This is a contentment with our own achievement in Christianity. A lack of true consciousness of sin and little earnest prayer. What was said of the Laodicean church describes us perfectly. Thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3, verse 17. So what then is the answer? Think of the answer for the Laodiceans. As many as I love, I, 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 I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3, 19. We must repent. But we need grace to repent. It is our duty. And yet we must cry unto the Lord for the desire and the ability to do it. With Jeremiah we cry, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Lamentations 5, 21. We need God to prepare us for revival. He must give to us the spirit of prayer and of supplication. We cannot work it up ourselves, though that does not excuse us. But in conclusion, I want you to notice the promise that is in this chapter. And there is some wonderful encouragement in this very chapter, at the end of the chapter. So then, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. Isaiah 59 verse 19. There is a promise that people shall fear the Lord from the west, that is from distant western isles like the British Isles, to the rising of the sun in the east, Iran, and be beyond that, to China and Japan. Also, 
when the enemy comes in like a flood, which is what we are experiencing today, that the Spirit of God will raise up a standard and marshal his forces against this evil. Further, there is a promise that the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Verse 20. Paul quotes this verse when speaking of the future conversion of the Jews. And so all Israel shall be saved, all the Jews. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Romans 11, 26. We pray and long for the Jews to have the blindness taken from off their eyes, and this in turn will lead to international revival. Lord, hasten the day. <laughs>